I'm Theodore Wheeler. I'm a novelist from Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, happy to take part in the series of dispatches from around the state for chapters, books, and gifts in Seward. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a couple of my novels uh, that you can get through chapters, uh, but also I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about my writing practice. Um, so chapters has suggested uh, showing off your writing space or office, uh, but most of the summer I've spent out here in my backyard. Uh, with the pandemic, uh, everybody in my family, my two daughters and my wife, we're all home, so it's a little loud, uh, not as much space inside uh, like everybody else. Uh, so when I need some peace and quiet to get some work done, usually I've been coming out here to the backyard. And luckily it hasn't been too hot lately or too rainy, of course, um, so that's worked. But I did bring out a couple items uh, that I usually keep pretty close. So first I have this souvenir cotton bale. Uh, that my grandfather, my grandpa Wheeler, gave to me. Uh, he grew up on a cotton farm in southern Missouri, so I always like to keep this close, somewhat to remember my roots, but uh, also just be grateful that I'm a writer and don't have to work on a cotton farm all day. Um, I also have this uh, piece of trench art, which uh, I quite about a year ago or so, or two years ago, but this was a, a shell, an artillery shell, that was used during World War I. It was manufactured in Dusseldorf, Germany in 1908, uh, according to the stamp on the bottom. Uh, but with trench art, so these were used in battle, and after it was fired during the downtime, one of the soldiers uh, would take tools and stencil in these designs and turn it into a piece of art. Um, I'd seen an exhibit of these at the Durham Museum a couple years ago and thought it was really cool, so I found this one on eBay and got it for myself. Although, uh, mostly, uh, one of my daughters has just used it for a piggy bank. So, a, a new use for it there. Alright, so the two books I'm going to talk about, uh, the first one is called Kings of Broken Things. Uh, this novel came out in 2017. Uh, it's kind of a coming-of-age story set among a race riot and lynching, um, which is uh, somewhat of a unique premise. Uh, so it's set in Omaha from 1917 to 1919, mostly follows a group of young German-American immigrant boys, um, how they navigate Omaha at that time. Uh, Tom Dennison, a notorious figure from Omaha's history, is the main character in this book. And it all kind of leads up towards the lynching of Will Brown in uh, September of 1919. So we just uh, observed the centenary for that last year. But um, anyway, you can get this through chapters. It's... Uh, a book I spent about seven years working on, so it's pretty near and dear to my heart, um, and I think it's a pretty good read as well. But uh, the one I'm going to read from today is called Inner Other Lives. This just came out in March, uh, on March 3rd actually, so I only got to do about two events in person before the pandemic shut everything down, uh, so my little pandemic novel here, Inner Other Lives. Uh, this is um, set in 2005, mostly 2008, here in Omaha. And it's kind of a domestic spying book, is how I think about it, uh, where the inciting action of the book is when a young man named Tyler Alls, who had disappeared uh, while working as a Christian missionary in Pakistan, reappears a year later in a terrorist ransom video. Uh, then the FBI, the CIA are working to figure out if you know he's a genuine uh, kidnap victim or if perhaps he's in cahoots. Uh, with the terrorists as he has somewhat of a checkered past himself. Uh, so the, the spying, you know, in this case is turned inward, where it's the, our own government spying on our, our, you know, its own citizens. And not only, you know, even further inward than that, you know, trying to see inside their personal lives, uh, and a lot of times trying to see, you know, their motivations, what they think about things, um, which I thought was a pretty interesting premise for a book. Um, so I'm going to read just a, a little bit from the, the first chapter here. Um, so this happens when uh, Elizabeth Holland, who's the main character of the book, and Tyler All's sister, uh, she's just learned that Tyler's been found, uh, her mom has called her. Uh, but instead of thinking about Tyler, uh, her ex-husband, who, uh, who had ran off and left her three years prior, uh, kind of pops into her head. So I'm going to pick up at that point. It was strange to have Nick Holland drop into her mind when her mother said they found him. What Elizabeth thought of that moment was Nick holding their baby the look on his face, that sly, almost unwitting smile. Nick so pleased with whatever joke he was keeping to himself because her mother had put his son in a silk baptismal gown, what he'd called a dress. She and Nick lived in a one bedroom ground floor in Chicago then, her dad poking around, an armchair flipped over on its top so he could fix where a spindle unglued out from its joint. Her mom practically pacing, manic, trying to explain the historical significance, the family lore, 
trying to explain the three generations of the pretty white gown she brought to put on Caleb. Nick was the one who dressed the baby in the gown, who slid white silk over newborn head and tightened the pleats with a sash, all with the balls trying to interfere over his shoulder, all without the baby crying. Elizabeth's parents, her mother especially, weren't comfortable with the fact that Nick had no religion, that he was godless, as they called it. Elizabeth even concealed how Nick was never baptized. Of course he was, Elizabeth lied on the phone to her parents when she called to tell them she'd married Nick. Everybody in Nebraska is baptized. This had to be the reason the Alls rushed down to Chicago the instant Caleb was born. Elizabeth's mother clutching the paperboard box that held the silk gown like it was a religious artifact, like it was the Shroud of Turin she dug out of their attic in Wisconsin. Already the Alls didn't like Nick. He was eight years older than their daughter. She was only 23 when she married him. And his godlessness made this gap harder to stomach. Still, couldn't they have left that gown in the car? Nick's bemusement at the situation delighted Elizabeth. He was quietly perplexed as he listened to Deb Alls go on about sacraments, baptism, reconciliation, etc., etc. Nick strolled up to the window with the baby to look where a guy was trying to tip a Chevy Metro over a snowbank without getting high-centered. City plows had barricaded in all the cars on the block, so Nick watched the sedan rock and his tires sink into the snow as he fingered the pleats and bleached lace that brocaded Caleb's chest. This was the Nick Holland that Elizabeth loved. Cowboy Nick, tall and lean, with a scuzzy beard. Exhaustion bowed his shoulders, his back, because he returned to the warehouse where he worked only a day after the baby was born. He didn't have to do that, but that's how he was. How I was raised, he'd say, to remind Elizabeth that he came from hard workers, farmers, that he'd risen before the sun most every day as a teenager, or so he claimed. Nick, who that day, unbathed in blue jeans and plain white tee, barefoot, at half past noon on a Thursday, woke only because company was at the door. Of course, the baby had disordered his hours. Why shouldn't he sleep when he had the chance? And in Chicago, he always worked nights. It wasn't clear to Elizabeth why she remembered Nick this way, his glancing over his shoulder at her, Caleb asleep in his arms all of a sudden. Well, he said, looking at Elizabeth, but speaking to her mother. We're not running out the door right this minute to dunk him in holy water, if that's what you expect. With the same sure hand, Nick slipped Caleb out of the gown and swaddled him in swaddling and set the baby in the bassinet without waking him. How did a guy like him know how to do a thing like that? Nick claimed he never even held a baby until the OB put Caleb in his arms in the delivery room. Elizabeth's legs still spread in the stirrups, and there's Nick with his son in his arms. Nick joyous, laughing, hair in his eyes, an infant cradled in his elbow. Was that a natural component of the cogs that made Nick Holland tick? Dusty good looks, a strong mind for trivial knowledge, a soft and assured touch with infants. And if this was so, this last component, then why did Nick run off and leave her and the baby so soon after that day? So I'll cut off there. Um, that's kind of the jumping off point of the book. Uh, you get a little taste of the, the style there and the voice of the book. But uh, again, that was Inner Other Lives, which is a new novel for me uh, this March. Um, also had kind of briefly mentioned Kings of Broken Things, which is my nooks, book set in World War I, uh, mostly in Omaha from 1917 to 1919. Uh, you can get both of these from Chapters, Books, and Gifts uh, if you go to www.sewardchapters.com. Uh, that'll get you pointed in the right direction, or uh, just call the store, email them, uh, they'll help you out. But thanks so much for listening. Thanks uh, to Tori and Chapters for getting this set up for me, and uh, everyone take care. Bye.